Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Or as I like to call it, the gateway holiday to Father's Day. Oh. Oh. We may need to edit that out. Well, it's good to have you here. Let's just open a word of prayer and then we'll get to announcements. Our loving Father, we thank you for this beautiful day you've blessed us with. We thank you that in the name of Christ, we can boldly come into your holy presence. Again, not by our own works of righteousness, which are like filthy rags, but Lord, we come boldly in the name and the person and the work of Jesus Christ. We thank you again for this day that you have made. Help us to have contrite hearts before you and hearts full of worship this morning. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of quick announcements here, of course. This morning is a special day. It's Mother's Day. And I want to share something with you about why God made moms. Now, this is not theological. This is not doctrine. This is answers given by second grade school children. I like how the guys are just smiling and the women are like, wait a minute. Why did God make mothers, second graders? Mostly to clean the house. I said, is this on? Why did God make mothers? To help us out of there when we're getting born. These are second graders. How did God make mothers? God made my mom just the same like he made me. He just used bigger parts. What ingredients are mothers made of? God makes mothers out of clouds and angel hair and everything nice in the world and one dab of mean. Second graders, don't shoot the messenger. Why did God give you your mother and not some other mom? We're related. Can't argue that. What kind of little girl was your mother? My mom has always been my mom and none of that other stuff. And the, another reason given by a second grader, what kind of little girl was your mom? They say she used to be nice. I love you moms out there. Why did your mom marry your dad? My grandma says that my mom didn't have her thinking cap on at the time. What does your mom do in her spare time? To hear her tell it, she pays bills all day long. What would it take to make your mom perfect? Well, on the inside, the second grader said, on the inside, she's already perfect. Outside, I think she said something about plastic surgery. If you could change one thing about your mom, what would it be? She has this weird thing about keeping my room clean. That's the first thing I'd get rid of. I'd make my mom smarter. Then she would know it was my sister who did it and not me. And last but not least, if you could change one thing about your mom, what would it be? I would like for her to get rid of those invisible eyes on the back of her head that catches me doing everything she's not supposed to know that I'm doing. Happy Mother's Day to you all. Well, our announcements this morning, you have your bulletin. Something exciting because uh, we have such a demand for prayer which is a good thing, we have included, we have added two more uh, uh, times of prayer. You'll see it in your bulletin. Monday nights, we have a praise and prayer at 7 p.m. That's also in the fireside room. We'll continue with our Wednesday prayer meeting and Bible study, again, in the fireside room. You can see the times laid out there. And Saturday morning will be a men's fellowship and prayer, again, in the fireside room. But the pre-registration is required. So if you're interested in any of those prayer times, please call ahead and book it with Jurgen. Our dear sister Esther Marie Martin has graduated to glory this past Wednesday. Uh, do keep Ed in your prayers. It's a, it's a difficult time. The funeral is tomorrow. There is visitation today at 2 to 4 at Tallman's. Uh, pre-registration is required for that as well. So please keep Ed in, her, in your prayers. Our photo directory uh, Jurgen has done his due diligence, so if you are not in the phone directory, you can look in the mirror for the person to blame for why you are not in the phone directory. So we have gone online and scoured the interwebs to find the most goofy looking picture of you and have included it in our phone directory. I'm just kidding, so relax. 
But uh, that will be coming out hopefully next week, both in a hard copy and in a PDF. And that's all the announcements I have for this morning. Today's key verse, as we consider Mother's Day today, Proverbs 31, 26 to 27 says, She opens her mouth with wisdom, and loving instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the way of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Our loving Father, again, we thank you so much. We thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. And this morning we thank you for moms and grandmothers and aunts and, and, and all those women who have made a godly impact in our lives. We give you praise and honor this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, Glenridge Bible Church. Good morning, kids, Disciple Land families. It's so good to have you all here today on this beautiful Sunday morning. It is refreshing. I'll just say that. Burr. It's a little brisk out here, but it's beautiful and the sun is shining. And I thought today is a good day to have a little bit of um, audience participation. We haven't done a whole lot of this, but I thought, you know, today's a good day for that. So I wonder if I could invite you to warm up with me. That means you and your cars get to join along. And I thought we would sing, first of all, This Is The Day, and sing it all together. But you sing in your car, and I'll sing here. But this is not the Angela show, so you, you need to sing with me, OK? All right, let's try that. Ready? This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice, and be glad in it, and be glad in it. Sing it out. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. Thank you. Very nice. Now that you're warmed up, I think you're ready for some more uh, audience participation. Because as Pastor Bobby was saying, of course, it's Mother's Day. And there's an old standby Sunday school song that I think probably we've all sung before. I'm not really even sure why it's a Sunday school song. I think it's more to get the, the wiggles out of the kids. But um, we're going to change the words a little bit today and uh, sing, If You're Thankful God Gave Us Mothers. And kids, we're going to use our voices, and we're going to use our bodies, and we're going to use our cars, for those of you who are adventurous and good sports. And that's all of you, I know. And we're going to sing some, this song together and have a little bit of fun and praise God for giving us mothers. All of us, we've all had mothers, and there are lots of other people in our lives also that, like Pastor Bobby just said, have been a godly influence to us, and we can be thankful for them as well. So it's to the tune of, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. But we're going to change it. If you're thankful God gave us mothers, blink your lights. Blink, blink. All right, that's going to be verse number one. So find where your lights are. And if you can't do that because your car's a fancy car or whatever and you can't blink your lights, you can, you can blink like this. I'll do my actions. Verse two is, if you're thankful God gave us mothers, swish your wipers. Swish, swish. All right. Oh, good. I'm already seeing people practicing. This is awesome. Yeah, good. All right, and the third verse, do we dare do this? Yes, we do. If you're thankful God gave us mothers, honk your horn. Beep, beep. Yeah, very good. And then hold on to your hats for verse 3, because it gets really exciting then. Okay, or verse 4, I mean. Okay, are we all ready? We all know what we're doing? Here we go. <clears throat> Let me make sure I'm starting in an okay key. If you're thankful God gave us mothers, blink your lights. Blink, blink. If you're thankful God gave us mothers, blink your lights. Blink, blink. If you're thankful and you know it and you want a way to show it. If you're thankful God gave us mothers, blink your lights. Blink, blink. Good. I like it. If you're thankful God gave us mothers, swish your wipers. Swish, swish. If you're thankful God gave us mothers, swish your wipers. Swish, swish. If you're thankful and you know it and you want to way to show it. If you're thankful God gave us mothers, swish your wipers. Swish, swish. All right, now get ready. If you're thankful God gave us mothers, honk your horn. Beep, beep. That's awesome. If you're thankful God gave us mothers, honk your horn. Honk, honk. 
And if you're thankful, then you know it on your own way to show it. If you're thankful, God gave us more bells. Honk your own. Honk, honk. I know this is a really exciting verse. All three. All right, don't get mixed up. If you're thankful God gave us mothers, do all three. Blink, blink, swish, swish, honk, honk. <laughs> if, if you're thankful God gave us mothers, do all three. Blink, blink, swish, swish, honk, honk. If you're thankful and you know it and you want a way to show it. If you're thankful God gave us mothers, do all three. Blink, blink, swish, swish, honk, honk. Yay! I knew you would be good sports. Thank you so much. That was fun. Kids, just think one day when you're old, you can tell your grandkids, once in church when we had to have church in cars, our cars praised the Lord for moms. Isn't that cool? Yeah, we probably wouldn't be able to say that otherwise. So there you go. Let's pray and thank God for our moms today. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can have fun on this Sunday morning together. Thank you that we can be creative and find new ways to do things do things that are old things, but do them in a new way. Thanks so much for giving us moms who have cared for us and loved us and taught us about you. Thanks for the other women you've put into our lives that have been a, a godly influence on us. And I pray, Heavenly Father, for each one of us that's here today, wherever we're coming from in our life situation, I pray a special blessing on each person who's here and that you would speak your word to us through Pastor Bobby and that uh, you would just bless this Sunday morning. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Have a great Sunday morning, everybody. Thanks, Angela. Who didn't honk their horn? Shame on you. Well, it is crisp and cool out here, but being a Winnipegger, I'd be embarrassed to put my jacket on because it is May. So I'm going to stay in these short sleeves. And when I left this morning, Laura asked me, is that what you're going to wear? Yeah. Okay. So that's what I'm wearing. This morning, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 2. And I want to just look at this, this mother of the Bible, considering it's Mother's Day. We'll take a bit of a break from John which was the break we're taking from James while we're outside, and focus on Hannah, the mother of the prophet Samuel. So if you have your Bibles, please open, or they're also in your bulletins, to chapter 2. We're picking up in her prayer, and I'll give a little bit of a background as we go through. But it begins in verse 1, chapter 2, first book of Samuel. Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because they rejoice in your salvation. No one is holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you, nor is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let no arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is the God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and those who stumbled are girded with strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, and the hungry have ceased to hunger. Even the barren has borne seven, and she, who has born, uh, and she who has many children has become feeble. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and lifts up. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among princes and make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. He will guard the feet of his saints, but the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength no man shall prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. From heaven he will thunder against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Then Elkanah went to his house in Ramah, but the child ministered to the Lord, speaking of Samuel, before Eli the priest. Our loving, gracious Father, we do come into your presence this morning to worship you in our hearts and in our minds, to grow in our knowledge about this woman, Hannah, a woman you used in a mighty way, through whose womb, whose, through whose faith you would bring us the prophet Samuel, the one who would anoint the king after your own heart. We thank you for mothers this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Washington Irving had said, and I quote, a mother is the truest friend we have.
when trials heavy and sudden fall upon us, when adversity takes the place of prosperity, when friends desert us, when trouble thickens around us, still will she cling to us, and endeavor by her kind precepts and counsels to dissipate the clouds of darkness and cause peace to return to our hearts, end quote. It's been said, I think rightfully so, that the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. That sums up in an incredible way our moms and women in general, what type of influence, what kind of impact they can have in the life of a child. That's the incredible impact that they can have both for good and for evil. One of the greatest examples of a mother, of a grandmother, of godly influence is in the life of young Timothy. One of the great examples, Paul remembers them as being godly women who had such a spiritually tremendous and dynamic impact on young Timothy that he compliments them, commends them, and it's forever written in the word of God. 1 Timothy 1 and 5 says, When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also a heritage of faith. Or in some situations, as I said, our mothers, there are some women in this world who can have an evil influence on our lives, in the lives of children. Like King Abijah, uh, he was the fourth king from, the, from, from David's house, the second king of Judah. He followed in the evil footsteps of his mother. His mother influenced him to worship the false cults. He only reigned for three short years. His reign, no doubt, was influenced, as I said, by, the cultish, uh, by his cultish mother and his wicked father. It led the nation of Judah to, become, to, to commit some of the most vilest sins imaginable. His name literally means, the sea is my father. He was named after a Canaanite deity. The scriptures characterize the influence this evil mother had on the nation through his rule. And it was anything but honoring to God. So we see the example, moms and dads, grandparents, aunts and uncles, anyone who's in a position of authority over a child. We can see and really begin to understand the weight of our influence on children and our call to live godly lives and righteous lives before them because little eyes are watching, little ears are listening, and little minds are forming thoughts based on our witness and our testimony or lack thereof. So we come back to Hannah, and in the first book of Samuel, which was probably written by the prophet himself, Samuel, he's describing for us, the purpose in his writing, he's describing for us uh, the dramatic and extraordinary rise to power and influence and the tragic fall of King Saul and the transition to Davidic rule. The book opens with an introduction to his family life before he was born. We are coming out of the dark ages of the judges, where everyone did evil. The nation of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And now God is going to raise up a king, and he's going to give us a comparison study between the king they desired, Saul, and the king after God's own heart, David. But it begins with the life of Samuel, which begins with the faithful prayer of his mother. We need to establish one fact. Not, the Bible never tells us that all women are supposed to be mothers, biologically speaking. In the same way that not all men are biologically called to be fathers. Not all men or women are called to be married. But it is a great blessing to bring forth a child. I've watched my wife carry five children to term and to give birth, and it truly is one of the most amazing experiences that you can encounter in this life. It is a uniqueness that alone women carry. They can carry a child in themselves, provide everything that little baby needs for its initial survival. It reminds us of what the psalmist says, for you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. It's through the wombs of our mothers that mankind continues to exist according to the common grace of God. Remember in Genesis 3 and 20, then Man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living things. And it is a great blessing to bring forth life into this world, but it is a a God-honoring blessing to influence a child in the way of righteousness and godliness. In Hannah's case, it didn't initially look like she was going to have a child for her husband Elkanah. 
Chapter 1 says Elkanah had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, the, other, the name of the other was Peniah. Peniah had children, but Hannah had no children. Now, in those days, it was common practice to mimic the surrounding cultures, conforming to them. In this case, Hannah, who was probably Elkanah's first wife, when, when she couldn't have children, Elkanah searched out a second wife and took to himself Penaniah. One of the most disturbing things that shows in the character of Israel in the day was just how carnal the priesthood was by accepting it, by, by readily accepting it. This was never God's intention for marriage. It was always between one wife and one husband. But it had become common practice. And eventually, we would see the need for Samuel to be raised up and assume the religious leadership of the country. We see the failure on Eli's part to be a righteous high priest. We see how poorly he parented his own sons and condemned their sins. He failed to do that. You know, it, we contrast that with the faithfulness and the godly character of Hannah. Not much is written about this godly woman. Only two chapters. A chapter and a half, really. But in it, we see her life. We see her faith. We see two times, twice in two chapters, a woman who prays. Praying to God. Crying out to the Lord. Exalting his name. Giving him thanks. Praising him as her rock. And so that should remind us of the importance of prayer. We talked about it recently in our Bible study and prayer meeting last week, about the importance of prayer. You know, I'll get to that in a minute. I don't want to get to that too soon. But but Hannah suffers through this, this misery. Her heart aches for a child. She can't conceive. She feels like a failure as a woman. You know, one time the tabernacle was in Shiloh, and there while... While the, the family was there, Elkanah and his two wives were there. It wasn't in Jerusalem yet. David, David had not yet made Jerusalem the religious uh, uh, center of Israel yet. But at one of those festivals at Shiloh, she, she rushes out to the tabernacle, rushes out to pray, to seek out God's face. In her prayer in chapter 1, she unloads her heart. It's a very vulnerable, very raw prayer. You can, if, when you read it, you can hear the agony in her heart and, and, and just the desperation to conceive. So much so that she even makes a promise to God. She makes a covenant with God that if, if he would bless her with a child, a son, a male, that she would return him to the Lord for his service. She pleads with God to give her a son. A son, as I said in chapter 1, verse 11, that she would return to him for his service. She promises never to cut his hair. That's the Nazarite value. You see that in Numbers chapter 6. Very familiar. Probably the most familiar case study on that is Samson. But with her heart completely broken over a situation, praying so quietly that Eli the priest thought she was inebriated, thought she was drunk, tries to send her home. She calls out to God to hear her servant's prayer. And the wonderful, incredible thing that we do know is that God did hear her prayer. And after some time, time had passed, she became pregnant with a son and named him Samuel. And what God did was God empowered her body to conceive. And he healed the pain and the sorrow of her situation. Samuel was truly, as all children are, but Samuel, in a very, very special case, was a wonderful gift from God. Chapter 2 breaks down her prayer. That's what we're looking at this morning. We're just going to look at it. We're just going to have a couple of quick points on it. And in a day and age where there seems to be such a lack of prayer, a lack of praise, a lack of power in our prayer, this Old Testament wife and mother's example is so fitting for our day and age. One of the first things we see in her prayer, they're the last words of Hannah in Scripture. The first words of her prayer, she praises him. She praises God. And the question i got to ask is, how often do we simply come into the presence of God just to praise him? She begins her prayer with, my heart rejoices in the Lord, my horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. No one is holy like the Lord. There is none besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. We don't pray like this anymore, do we? At least 
I struggle to, if I'm perfectly honest. I don't hear a lot of prayers like this. She rejoiced, horn exalted. You know, when we pray, do we participate in it as a, you know, a, a, simply a repetitive religious experience? Or do we come into his holy presence to bathe in his glory, in his righteousness, in his goodness, to commune with him because he's our father, to acknowledge that he alone is worthy to be praised? Do we simply just come into his presence to be with him? Do we cry out, my heart rejoices in the Lord, just to be in that wonderful presence of God, to be there because I rejoice, as Hannah said, in your salvation. In her case, it was the salvation from her situation of having a barren womb and the ridicule at the hands of Penaniah to give her, her husband Elkanah a son. She was delivered. That was her salvation. For us, our salvation is in the cross of Christ. How much more should we bathe in the presence of God and praise him for what he has done? You know, the problem a lot of us have is, if we're brutally honest, and I speak for myself, is there's probably a number of reasons we neglect to pray. We discussed at our prayer meeting, and for those that were there, this will be somewhat of a repeat, but I think it's important to stress these things. Sometimes we don't know how to pray. Maybe we don't know how to pray. One of the things in my course over the last few months in pastoral ministry is the importance of knowing how to pray. Many of us learn to pray as children. And where do we learn? We learn table graces and bedtime prayers and Jesus, now I lay me down to sleep, and so on and so forth. And those are precious prayers from the heart of a child. But as we grow in the faith, as we are born again and regenerated by his spirit, our prayers should take a depth, a spiritual depth and a theological depth, a step of depth, as we get further and further out into the waters of spiritual maturity. When we reach adulthood, we don't really receive instruction. We don't know how to pray. You know, we, we read all these admonitions to pray. We hear it in sermons. I'm preaching to you about it now, and I preach to my own heart first. But have you ever been taught or mentored how to pray? And I'm not talking about a rigid, structured prayer, but the purpose of prayer and how to pray. How, uh, what is, what, why are we even praying? There are a lot of Christians that can't even answer that question. And they think that God is some type of cosmic genie that we come to and we just simply ask and take. Claim it and take it. Well, that's not what prayer is. You know, you go to the Gospels and you see the Lord Jesus Christ when he prays. And what I found amazing was each of the times that he's recorded praying, each of the times that he's recorded praying goes above and beyond the required prayers of the Orthodox Jew of the first century. They had specific times of prayer. And Jesus, perfect in his divine being and his person as a man, would submit to those times of prayer according to Judaism. But when we see him praying, when we see him alone in praying, when his disciples come to him as he's preparing on how to reveal to them that he is the Christ, that how the Father is going to reveal to, the fa- or the, to, to Peter that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, we find him in prayer and the disciples come to him. You back up a few chapters and you see before he's, he selects the disciples. Where is he? He is praying. He goes to the other side of the lake. Why? To pray. I called them, and and I got a bit of a giggle on Wednesday about this, but these are his overtime prayers. These aren't the required prayers of Judaism. He is praying for the sake of being in the presence of his Father and to be strengthened by him for the ministry of the day. And so we've all heard if Jesus had to pray, how much more so do we have to pray? Maybe we don't know how to pray. Maybe we're busy. Hannah took the time during a festival season to come to the tabernacle to pray, to seek out God's presence, to seek out God's face. In the Old Testament covenant, it was locally uh, uh, understood to be at the tabernacle. Now, Jesus says, we pray in spirit and truth. We pray here in the parking lot of Glenridge Bible Church. We pray in our homes. We pray in our cars. You can pray anywhere. Continually being in the presence of God. You know, life comes at us fast. You'll never, never hear an older person at, toward the end of their life say, wow, life really dragged on. It's in a blink of an eye and it's gone. Like a vapor. Here today, gone tomorrow, like the flower in the fields. It comes fast, and so we need to be deliberate, as Hannah was, to take time to pray. We can be distracted, so easily distracted. 
I use this example again for those who are at prayer meeting. I'm sorry, but I'll, you know, I'll go down to pray and just, oh, oh, I better get up. I got to answer the door. There's somebody there. And I just get distracted. I got the attention span of a canary. We have to be deliberate and disciplined and carve out that time to pray. You know, maybe, maybe we hide from God. Maybe there's some sin in our life. And so we retreat from the presence of God. Because when we come into his presence, like Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6, we realize our, our sinful and woeful condition. And so we, we kind of backtrack. We, we begin to abandon our relationship with God as opposed to keeping a short account with him. When we mess up, like Adam and Eve in the garden, we run away and we hide. It's those times where we need to come to the presence of God, confess our sin, and reestablish that relationship with him. Maybe you don't see answers. I'll get to that in, a little, in, a, in another minute. Maybe we feel we're self-sufficient. I'm a self-made man. There are no such things. It's the Lord who directs the paths of our lives through the decisions we make. But he has a plan for our lives. You know, we try to chart our own paths. We try to make our own way. We rely on ourselves. That can-do spirit that we hear so often about. But if we navigate our lives using our own wisdom and strength, we're going to be very ill-equipped to face the darkened skies and the storms of life that arise if we are not in constant communion with our Father. Or maybe you're experiencing doubt. We often talk about believing in God, but prayer happens when we believe in God. That's where we pick up with Hannah. She came into God's presence because she knew that there was only one who could answer her prayers. We simply, at times, don't pray maybe because we don't believe that God's promises apply to us. In Hannah's case, she had this deep desperation to bless her husband with a child. And she wanted to be delivered from the cruelty and the abuse of Elkanah's other wife. In our cases, it may not be a child. Maybe there's another struggle in your life. Maybe... Maybe it's uh, fear. Maybe you live in constant fear or, or terror. Maybe insecurity. Maybe you're an insecure person. Maybe you're going through a depression. I go through depression. I go through seasons and valleys, just like the rest of us. I'm no different than you. Maybe it's sickness. Maybe it's hunger, physical or spiritual. Maybe it's unemployment. Maybe you're underemployed, you're having a hard time paying the bills. We look around, we see the world, we watch the newscasts, and the first 29 minutes are full of painful stories of what's happening in the world, and of course they top it off with a dog playing piano, so you go away feeling better for a few seconds. But life is hard. Not only does it come at you fast, but it's hard. It's very hard. Maybe, maybe you're in a position of destitution. Whatever the situation is, don't assume that God does not hear our prayers. The psalmist said, I can't remember exactly where it is, but he inclines his ear. That's where I get that phrase. I always, he bends his ear toward his children, lovingly, as a father. He hears the prayers of a righteous man. But if we assume that God doesn't hear our prayers, that will usually result in us neglecting prayer, and our prayer life will suffer. Our prayer life suffers, we pray less, we pray less because our prayer life suffers and the cycle continues. And that's what the enemy wants to do, drive a wedge between the source of power for us in this life. I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. And that comes through a constant communion and relationship, ongoing relationship with the Lord. He hears our prayers. When you pour out your heart as Hannah did, in praise first, exalting the name of the Lord. But back in chapter 1, the, the desperation in her heart. God hears the longings and the pain of all of our hearts. What we need is the faith to believe that God actually does hear our prayer and does answer our prayers. Not necessarily the way we want them to be answered, but he will answer the prayers of a righteous man, that of his children. Hannah was a godly mother. She gives us some incredible insight, a lesson on prayer. This mother gives us uh, this, this structure of first offering praises to the one who is worthy to be praised. She begins with a thankful heart. You know, that's something that I even struggle with. I'm sure many of us struggle with, to be thankful for what God has blessed us with. Just count your blessings. Take a moment to count them. 
And you'll be overwhelmed at how our cup of blessing overflows. It's easy to look at what we don't have. That's what the enemy wants us to do. A covetous heart to see what he has and she has and they have and what I don't. But God wants us to see what he has blessed us with. That begins with the cross. That begins with Jesus Christ. She thanked him for, his per, for her personal deliverance, as I said, delivering her from the ridicule and abuse that was she, she was taking. God blessed her with a son, a male, as she prayed for in chapter 1, verse 11. Delivered her from the stigma of being a barren woman. And in those days, that was an unbearable burden to carry. Because throughout the Old Testament, it was considered a judgment of sin, the old retribution theology that Jesus began to dismantle in the, uh, in the gospel age. God gave her this ability in her body to conceive and bear a child, and now she could boast over her enemies because not of what she could do, it was not in her own strength, but because of what the Lord had done and the Lord's deliverance from that chapter of her life. You know, we can say the same thing, and I have to, I have to say this again. We can boast today, not in our own strength, for we are God's workmanship, Ephesians 2, but we can boast in the Lord for our own personal salvation. You know, maybe... This morning, you're sitting here and you're, talk, you're thinking, what's this thing about personal salvation? That is a personal trust in the finished work of Christ on the cross. That Jesus Christ is sinless, the sin bearer of the world, of his people, and that he came into the world as the scriptures described through a virgin birth, lived a perfectly righteous life, lived in perfect obedience to God's law, and was led by the Spirit through the wilderness, through his ministry, was empowered by him, identified with people, and took upon himself as the, as, as, as the lamb led to the slaughter, and there went to the cross and died in our place. And in that darkness for those few hours, that's where Jesus faced he faced the judgment for our sin, that he was buried and he was raised the third day. And if you believe in that, and you trust in that, and you know that he's alive at God's right hand, and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, as it says in Romans, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And the wrath of God that, the, that, that, that uh, John describes in chapter 3 toward the latter end, the wrath of God that was once upon you is gone. Because it's been paid in full by Jesus Christ on the cross. For that we can boast. Not in our own strength, no matter how strong you might think you are. But because Jesus Christ paid the price. Jesus Christ is the one. And so we boast in him. Our horn is exalted to him. We know where our strength comes from. We know where our mercy comes from. We know where our life comes from, and it comes from him. It is the Lord who has the power to deliver us from the hand of our enemies. And he has in the cross, and he will continue to do so until the ultimate day when we are ultimately redeemed from this world, from these frail, weak, sinful, sin-bent bodies. I have given you authority, he says, to tread on snakes and scorpions and over the power of the enemy, and nothing will ever be able to harm you, Luke 10 and 19. 1 Corinthians 10 and 13 says that the Lord alone can deliver us from the temptations of life. One of my favorite verses, temptation has not come upon, you, uh, come upon you except what is common to humanity. But God is faithful, who will not permit you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but will also make a way together with the temptation so that you may be able to endure it, really to bear up under it and have a victory over it. That comes from God, and so we can rejoice and boast in the Lord for his work. Is in the Lord we can live a triumphant and victorious life by our faith. 1 John 5, 4 and 5 says, Who is he who overcomes the world? Our faith. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And so he gives us the, 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 the power, and we can boast in that, to live a victorious life by our faith in him. It was the Lord who gave Hannah the ability to conceive and bear a son and name him Samuel. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I am helped. Therefore my heart greatly rejoices and my song I will praise him. Psalm 28 and 7. Hannah's sense of strength to overcome her, cir her circumstances and her situation came from God. It was rooted in her faith in a God who hears the prayers of his people. That's why she uses that figurative language, like I said, uh, like a horn, like an ox big, strong animal who lifts up high his horn, holding it high, conscious of the strength she was receiving from God, the God who answered her prayer. 
And Hannah goes on to acknowledge the truth that there is only one God, only one God, the one God who gives life, no one who is holy, no one who is set apart like the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There is no other God in this world. He is the one who is holy, who is set apart. Makes him, he's, God is marked in the scriptures as holy, holy, holy. We, are, we, we talk a lot about his love and his grace, and those, those, are part, those are attributes of his character. Absolutely true. But he is gracious, he is loving, because he is holy. And because of that holiness, God never winks at sin. But they, it must be addressed. And that's why we experience his love as we see Jesus on the cross. We experience his grace when we are quickened to the truth and are born again. You know, Hannah acknowledges that her salvation, as I said from the situation she was facing of having a barren womb and unable to give birth, she was saved from that in the same way we have been saved from the barrenness of a life without God. A life where eternally we'll be cast out into the outer darkness with the wailing and the gnashing of teeth. Hannah knew that God alone is holy. And our salvation comes from him alone. He is is perfect in his essence. Perfect in his character. And that's what she does. She praises him and thanks him for being holy and set apart. In his behavior, his righteousness, his morality, in distributing justice, God is perfect. The Lord is holy in every detail of his being. And Hannah declared that there was no one holy like the Lord. How many times do we pray that way? I fail. I fail, to be honest with you, to come into his presence, acknowledge his holiness, other than lip service. But to be in his holy presence and to have a contrite heart like like Isaiah, well, that can be challenging. But when we consider his holiness, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, the one who knows the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the great I am. Well, we should come into his presence often with praise. Praise should be about our lips every day. So coming through her prayer again, she goes on to say that there is no one beside the Lord. There's no one equal to God. There's no one who is equal, no one who gives God counsel. God knows all things. You think God didn't know about COVID-19 and all the, the ramifications and all, the, all, the, all the, uh, the, the collateral damage that's happening? You think God was unaware of this? That somehow it came across his divine desk and he said, I missed that one. Of course not. God knows all things. There's no one like him. He is the only living and true God and from him proceeds all life. All life. It didn't happen 90, 70 billion years ago. I'm more of a young earth creationist, but I'm not going to get into a debate about that. But I know the source of life. I know that God spoke and it was. It takes greater faith to believe that we came from nothing. That God created without any pre-existent material according to the word of his mouth. And his spirit hovered over the earth and brought forth all the vegetation, all the, all the animals of the sea and the land. And then finally the, the crowning jewel of creation. The only thing that bears his image. Let us create man in our image. And so from him proceeds all life. There is none like him. He is the only God who could have answered her prayer. In a polytheistic society, as it is today, there are so many prayers that go out to dead deities, to non-existent deities. In those days, Canaanite deities and all these different nations that surrounded Israel, they all had their gods that they prayed to, but you might as well just come out here and pray to one of these posts that you're going to put in. That's the same type of answer you'll get, nothing. But to pray to God, to know that he hears the prayers of his people, the one who lives eternally, he is the one without beginning or end, never having been created in the minds of the created. He's the one who possesses unlimited power and is able to answer prayer according to his will. She says that he is the living God. He is the one that gave Hannah a new life. He is the one that can give you a new life. And if you have believed, he is giving you a new life. You have it now. No one could have done this. No one could have given Hannah a son and salvation. And no one can give us salvation today and the forgiveness of sins 
except God, who is the author, source, and sustainer of all life. There is none like God. Moses came to the same conclusion when he witnessed the power of God in his song in Exodus 15 and 11. And you remember, that was during the days of the plagues and the deliverance from Egypt. Who is like you among gods, Yahweh? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, awesome in praiseworthy action, doing wonders? To be a fly on the wall in those days, to behold the salvation of God. Well, we behold the salvation of God 2,000 years ago when Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, went to the cross. And we behold the wonders of God to save wretched sinners like us through the blood of his cross. Hannah goes on to describe God as a rock. It's this incredibly powerful picture of strength and protection and security and safety in his eternal nature. When we build our foundations on this rock, on the foundation of God, we know that he has the power to love us, to support us, to carry us through. He becomes the cornerstone of our life. He upholds us in this life until we go home to heaven to be with him because he is the unmovable rock, the eternal God. Psalm 6 and 2, only he is my rock and my salvation, my high stronghold. I shall not be greatly shaken. This world is going to throw a lot of garbage at us. Life itself can be so challenging. But if our foundation is on him, he is immovable. And so we, our faith in him, provides us with the security and the knowledge that all these things must come to pass. But that he is with us, faithful, always, even to the end of the age, Matthew 28. And then Hannah's prayer turns into a warning to the arrogant. Her husband had an arrogant, self-sufficient other wife. And so she warns her, warns anyone who lives proudly, who doesn't live on the stability and the stronghold of the rock. Anyone like Penaniah who, who, who boasted in themselves and who ridicule others. A warning to all future generations, really, that God will judge the deeds of us all. Believer and unbeliever. Believer not unto salvation, but unto rewards in heaven. That's a whole other conversation of itself. But we will, as believers in Christ, if your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life, the issue of salvation, that's been settled once and for all. But the issue of what you have done with that salvation, the talents, if you were the spiritual talents you have been blessed with, what you're doing with those, we will have to give an account for that. We will have to come before the, the throne of Christ and give an account for the grace that we have enjoyed in him. Again, not unto judgment, because we're saved. We're saved in his work. And since he ever lives, that work ever lives in us. But we will give an account for the grace that we enjoy in him. For the unbeliever, they will give an account before the terrifying, great, white throne judgment of God that, that is mocked today. But there will be no mocking in that day. When those come before God and all their deeds are laid naked before him and, and, the, and the records of their lives are opened and upon whose merit do you stand? They stand on their own merit. They will be found wanting and cast out in judgment. And I believe as believers, we will see that. And we will wail and we will weep. And then God will wipe away the tears from our eyes. But there's a judgment coming. And Hannah, in her prayer, warns of that. To the arrogant, to the self-sufficient, to those who would rather reign in hell than serve in heaven. To you, that judgment is coming. And it's not something to be trifled with. God will not be made a mockery. He will judge the deeds of us all. He can come in this life. He does at times judge us. There is, in a, in a sense, some retribution theology. A lot of times it comes through the consequences of our sin and actions. And while we're living on this earth. But if it doesn't affect us today, if we are not judged in a sense in this world, it will be executed to us when we come face to face with the living God. As I said, for the believer, we will have to give an account for the grace that we enjoy in him. We've been blessed with this opportunity to 
see Hannah's prayer, to see this great example for us. The warning, whether it's military men, verse five, 4, or the wealthy, verse 5, or the lowly or the barren, verse 5 again. And on she goes, she gives that, that worthy. You know, God, God can make the mightiest army collapse if it's his will. He can take the wealthy and change their circumstances so they take the bitterness of extreme poverty by his will. God can take the weak, the destitute, and the lowly and make them strong. He can raise them up from sickness. He can give the the simple-minded, like myself, the simple-minded, and he can give them profound insight and wisdom. He can do that with us. With all this being true, who are we, as Hannah says, who are we to boast in ourselves? Who are we to be so proud and arrogant? Our boasting, like Hannah, should be in the Lord alone. What a great example. What a great example for us today in the day of pride and arrogance and self-seeking, adoration. We adore God. We exalt his name. We are lowly. And he is mighty and exalted. You know, Hannah, as I wrap this up, partially because I'm freezing up here, <laughs> but I, Hannah experienced this incredible power from God this incredible answer to prayer when she conceived and gave birth to a son named Samuel, which means heard by God. The very name of this prophet is a testimony to how he came to be in this world. Through the prayers of his mom, she came to the tabernacle and prayed. There are so many moms, godly women, grandmothers, aunts. I've witnessed them as they pray, and they pray fervently for many things. But if I know for a mom, a godly mom, who loves the Lord, they pray every day for their children. They pray for their safety, they pray for their well-being and all those wonderful things, it's true. But they pray, I, I know, for their salvation. A child cannot ride their parents' coattails into heaven. We're all orphans in a sense. We're all children, if we believe, by God's call. All children of God. And you've heard it said, God has no grandchildren. And so a mom, I've seen this, I've experienced it, I've watched it. I've prayed with moms as they pray, and they just, they're so broken. Some of you out here might be broken over a prodigal, a child who's never trusted the Lord, and they pray for that child. And I would encourage you that sometimes you'll see your prayers answered, sometimes you won't. But God hears that prayer. I believe it was George Mueller, I could be wrong, if you want to correct me afterwards, I know people love to correct the preacher, so I give you permission on this one. But I believe it was George Mueller who I read recently, he, he prayed for five people to be saved. I don't know the entire context of the story, but he was praying specifically for five people. And over the course of his entire ministry, after a few years, he saw one of those he was praying for saved. And then years would pass, continuing to pray for these other people, these other four, and another came to the Lord. And he continued to pray. And finally, the third came to know the Lord. And then, toward the end of his life, the fourth. And then George Mueller went home. Never having that fifth person that he was praying for answered, that prayer answered in his lifetime. But after his death, the fifth person he was praying for, who he didn't witness in this world, come to the Lord. That fifth person came to be saved and trust in Christ. That's the power of prayer, and that's what Hannah's emphasizing here, is that there is a great power in prayer because God hears our prayer. Who are we to boast? And so I just want to encourage you, moms and dads and grandparents and all of you who are here today, to continue to seek out God in prayer. Like Hannah, praise him. 
praise him. Start with who he is. Our God is holy and, and majestic and, and a wonder of wonders. And thank him for the many blessings that we have, beginning with the cross of Christ. And just watch how your prayer life explodes as you begin to see answered prayer. Not a name and claim it kind of nonsense, false teaching we see so often today, but how he does answer prayer according to his will. And you know it's a yes, it's a no, it's a wait. It comes in one of those three ways. In the same way my children come and talk to me, Dad, can I have this, can I do this? And I either say yes, no, or just hang on, just wait. And the Lord answers our prayer. You know, we can, as we look at this prayer, and you know, Hannah was, she was no theologian. She didn't go to Bible college. She wasn't a pastor. She wasn't an elder or a deacon. She wasn't a leader in Israel. She was just a mom. But is there such a thing as just a mom? She was a godly mother who searched out God's heart and when she had Samuel, watched him grow, cared for him, loved him, and then gave him back to the Lord as she promised. She was a virtuous woman who kept her word. And through it all, she gave glory to God in all things. What an incredible example to us, moms, dads, grandparents, to all of us who can influence the lives of others. The power of prayer and the influence of godly people in the lives of our youngsters. Let's pray. Our loving Father, we thank you again so much this morning for Mother's Day, and we thank you again for the wonderful testimony and example of Hannah, a simple woman who cried out to you in her need, and in faith called upon the living God, the one God who could answer her prayer, and you blessed her with the great prophet Samuel, the one who would set Israel on her course toward the Davidic throne and the great promise of the one who would come from the line of David, Jesus Christ. We see these incredible breadcrumbs throughout history that you would use in the faithfulness of so many to, to bring about the coming of the Messiah, our Savior, Jesus. And so this morning, as we begin to make our way home, we just thank you again for your faithfulness. We do confess our, our sin of not praying as often as we should of not basking in your presence, of not praising you first. And Lord, you know our needful hearts. And so you do graciously call us to come to you and to lay our petitions at your, at your feet. We thank you that you're a loving Father. Father, I pray for those this morning who maybe come from a family who did not have a godly influence, who did not have godly mothers or fathers. I pray that you would soften their hearts if there be some who are listening, who are here this morning. We would just pray again that you would show them the wonderful, boundless grace and love that you have for them as it is seen, it is evidenced on the cross of Christ. Just thank you again for godly moms, not perfect, but those moms who you have chosen, whom you have ordained to be our moms. We pray your blessing on them and all the women of Glen Ridge Bible Church this morning. We give you thanks and honor and praise and ask again for your traveling mercies as we head home. I pray your blessing on each one here this morning, each one who is listening this morning, and each one who will be watching whatever time of day it might be. May they sense your blessing, your comfort, your presence, your love, your grace, your mercy, because you are holy. And we thank you that you are a holy God who reconciles us to you through your Son. And so it's in Christ's name we give you thanks, and for his sake we pray. Amen. Happy Mother's Day. Have a wonderful day. Just a reminder that the, uh, you will be ushered out. Love you guys. Have a good day.